Welcome to Al Bernstein Unplugged Unboxing. In a 40-year Hall of Fame career, Al has chronicled some of the greatest moments in boxing history. On this podcast, you get to hear him expand on those memories and talk about the current news in the sport of boxing. You also hear Al interview some of the biggest names in the sport. Here's Al Bernstein Unplugged. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the show. Well, you know, in my 40 years of announcing boxing on television, I've seen many instances where the entertainment world merged or intersected with the boxing world. And just such an occasion will happen on April 17th when a new uh, boxing series begins. It's called Fight Club. And this show is going to merge music and boxing, much as the Tyson Jones uh, pay-per-view did, and uh, Ryan Cavanaugh and his Triller company, who created the Tyson Jones pay-per-view show, are creating this one as well, and their creative partner in this endeavor is Snoop Dogg. Now, we get a chance on this show to chat with Snoop Dogg. We'll talk to him about this series that he's co-creating, and we get to talk to him about a wide range of topics, and he is a fascinating and likable guy, and I think you'll enjoy our conversation, and here it is. Snoop, thank you first for uh, for doing this interview. Much appreciated. Hey, much love and respect, Al. You know how much I love you. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Uh, you know, you are a huge sports fan, of course, and uh, but boxing is another sport that not everybody who's a huge sport fan doesn't get into. Most do. Who was the boxer that got you into being a, a boxing fan? I would have to say Muhammad Ali. You know, I'm a 70s baby. I grew up in the 70s, so I got a chance to see Muhammad Ali up close and personal and see him, you know, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yeah. Got a chance to see his charisma, his style, his grace, see how he worked with Howard Cosell. Just seeing how he just, you know, was he was the people's champ, and, and that really made me love boxing. Yeah, it's, it, so many people feel that way, and he and he's, he was a catalyst to get so many people. So here you are now. Uh, did you ever think that, you know, with all the endeavors you've had, and they've been so varied and, and many, did it ever cross your mind that you would be commentating on boxing and creating a boxing series? Well, you know, I, I felt like my, my career was going to gradually grow me into things that were fun for me and that, that things that I actually had knowledge on. And me being that I have knowledge on boxing and I love it and I'm a fan of it, the opportunity for itself as far as us being able to create our own, you know, boxing lane and, been, and then have us commentating with great boxing analysts as well. You know, I had Sugar Ray Leonard on the side of me. That <laughs> to mention, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, that gave us a... Um, a position to show that we really do love this and we really could be great at this if you just stop, take time and listen and see exactly that there's a different side to analyzing boxing as well. It's the same sport, but it's just a different perspective on how people look at it and how they perceive it. Yeah, and you brought something unique to it, that's for sure. Listen, no one will ever duplicate the line you said when Roy Jones and uh, Mike Tyson were in the ring and you said, you know, this feels like a couple of my uncles fighting at the barbecue. <laughs> a line I would never have the, have gotten to use, and only you could use it. That's great. That's the truth. You know, it felt like that. <laughs> that was that was a classic. I love that. And you will get a chance to uh, do more of your commentary because you have created, along with Ryan Kavanaugh, uh, a new series um, uh, called uh, uh, Fight Club, and uh, it's going to start on April seventeenth. You've got um, Ben Askren and uh, Jake Paul in the main event, and then there'll be other great fights and. Of course, like the the Tyson uh, Jones fight, this will be a a, a, a merging of music and uh, uh, and boxing. And this was kind of born out of the the Tyson Jones thing. And how much did you guys plan to do this even before that? I think before we really wanted to do it, but we didn't really have the right you know pieces to the puzzle. And then once mm-hmm. we started, you know reaching out to people and finding out that there was an interest from the boxers, from the entertainers and just from the whole world in general, it just felt like the thing to do. And it felt like boxing needed a, you know, a, a makeover, or, you know, just something to add to it because it's such a great sport that's been there for so many years. And it's like, you don't want to see it die down and you don't want to see people, you know, fall into other sports and watch other yeah. things when the origin is boxing. You know, UFC was sprung off of boxing. MMA sprung off of boxing. But those sports are doing very well. So it's only right to pay homage by adding on an extension to boxing 
by keeping it still in the boxing world, but adding different things to it to make it more entertaining. And that's what you guys did. And, you know, it, it, already it was done with the Tyson Jones telecast. And, of course, you're going to expand it. One of the things that's interesting is people have kind of tried to merge music and boxing, but not 100% succeeded. But that seems like it's the template moving forward. And it really worked very well. Why do you think it, that worked so well that evening? Well, you got people like Ryan Kavanaugh, myself, the Triller team, and then the people who actually know how to produce, you know, one mm -hmm. thing about the team that we have, we find the best at what, at what they do. We were looking at trying to bring you production as if you were watching a movie, not watching a boxing event. And that's where we, you know, take a different perspective on knowing what's out there and knowing what's needed. And we know that people want to be entertained. They want to have a great time. They don't want to have to stop. They want to just be entertained from top to bottom during the fights, after the fights, you know, while the fights are being prepared and then just entertainment in general. And that's what we provide. Yeah, it made for a very fast-paced broadcast in a, in, a, in a lot of respects. The other thing that I've noticed over the years, and all the years I've been doing this and, um, and interacting with uh, musical performers and entertainers in general, it is amazing that so many uh, entertainers and people in show business love boxing. It's the one sport that I think uh, seems to attract the most people almost. Uh, and one, Jerry Lewis, of all people, once said to me uh, over dinner, you know, I think boxers are like entertainers. You know, it's a similar kind of discipline. They're putting on a show. We're putting on a show. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And why do you think entertainers are so drawn to the sport? I think just because the dedication that's that's taken to become a boxer, like the, the preservation of certain things that you have to keep to yourself while you're training, and then the mind state, and then the mentality that you have to have towards your opponent, and then the way you have to conduct yourself out of the ring, and then just the way in the ring. Because some guys have to be very mean in the ring, but then you see that they're nice guys outside of the ring. So it's just a tough yeah. thing in general, and it relates to the same thing that we do. Because if we have to perform or have to act we may take on a role that's really not who we are but we have to pull that role off and then we have to go back into the real world on being who we are and that's just a natural you know magnet their world our world we're the same kind of people when the bright lights are on they tend to shine and we tend to shine and we tend to love to have a good time and once you start you know talking and conversing what you find out is that people love people no matter what their occupation is what their sports are or what their lifestyle is it's just a matter of when people start to communicate and start to understand that they're the same, that's when relationships are built. Yeah, that's for sure. One of the things I loved about your GGB show, uh, it, it, what I love about it is uh, you have different, so many different people that you interview. And uh, I thought your interview with Floyd Mayweather was fascinating. You did him and of course you did Mike Tyson as well. But I love the Mayweather one because you, I felt like there was a, an interesting rapport between the two of you. Of course, you're friends, you know each other, but uh, that what you're just talking about now, you kind of really bridged the gap uh, between, or not bridged the gap. You kind of showed how entertainment and boxing merges together. Yeah, and I think that conversation with me and Floyd was was groovy because it was right before the big fight. Right. He wasn't giving nobody that insight that he gave me. And I no. Come to him like the normal, you know, guy interviewing him would, and it made him feel very comfortable to know that. He was conversing with his friend as opposed to right. like trying to throw a question out there to, you know, to throw him off balance. Everything that I was saying was setting him up to look better. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and I thought about that because that interview was done at that time when you, you kind of have your game face on. But a combination of all those things allowed it to be so free flowing and fun, um, you know, and it was it was good. Um, all right, so there are a few people on this planet who uh, have been as eclectic and as you have and done as many things and uh i want people use the word reinvent yourself but i don't think in your case it's reinventing yourself it feels like it's just touching a part of you that you want to use whether it's as a businessman or as an artist uh or or even as as a person with things like your youth football and all those things it feels like it's important to you to do as many things as you can do on this on this earth and experience as many things as you can. I mean, I think that's what God puts us in for, so we can uh, be a vessel to the greatness that he made when he made this earth. And it's your job to get out and live every day 
because you only die once, so you should live every day. And I just feel like me doing so many different things, touching so many different entities and finding ways to find myself in different positions to, you know, show that there's a way that you can do it and you can overcome. Because when I do find ways to reinvent myself or do different things, it's a challenge. It's a, me going on the edge saying, you know what, I got to take a gamble on me. And when it works, it makes you want to gamble on yourself to see that you don't have to just maintain one or where you can find different ways to be better at different things in life, like mastering yourself. Like I've mastered me to where I can do anything I want because I love doing it and I love the results that I get from the people and how it makes them feel. Yeah, it's a very good, good way to, to phrase it. And of course, not all your endeavors are about uh, commerce or, uh, or your brand or making money. Some of the things you do are very much driven by I think by just your desire, uh, your, your involvement in youth football, I think is a perfect example of that. You are really committed to that. And uh, what drove that, of course, your son. And by the way, we have a, a mutual friend, Rashid Ali, and her husband, Bob, are good, very good friends of mine. And I know their son played with your son uh, at Bishop Gorman. So they say hello to you. Yes, sir. Biagio, my nephew. Yeah. He's great grandson. He's a good he's a good young man, isn't he? Yeah, and uh, they're wonderful people. Uh, but what was it that drove your uh, your passion for that? I think you know when my when my sons was playing, and I would go back to the community, and I would see that it wasn't catered to the urban communities that they really wasn't looking out for the single parents and the ones who really didn't have the finances. So I just wanted to put together a league where I could make it you know school based and grade based to where we were looking for student athletes and. It wasn't so much about the parents paying the money, but the kids having good grades and we giving them a discount based off of that. And then it spun into, you know, different guys who were from the communities that were ex-gang members or either ex-football players coming back to the community, wanting to care, wanting to give something back. And then it grew and grew and it grew and it grew to where, you know, we started in 2005. Now we have put 15 kids in the NFL. We have amazing. 100 kids graduated from Division One programs. We send in more every year. And then we started to snoop use special stars where we deal with kids with special needs. We started that three years ago. So we're dealing with those kids and letting them come out and have fun and play flag football. And they're starting to be inserted into the real world and they feel real good about themselves. And we're doing an animated cartoon right now where a couple of those kids will be starring as the voices and being a part of it. So we're just trying to find ways to give back to these kids. Yeah. That's my thing is the kids. It started off as my kids and then it became my kids. So all kids are my kids. It was like my kids in general. Then I felt like all of these kids became my kids because I started coaching them. I started being, you know, a part of their lives. And even to this day, as kids, that's 27, 20 years, 28 years mm. old, they call me Coach Snoop. It's amazing. You, yeah, you must feel amazing. Uh a sense of accomplishment, looking at them as, as adults and knowing that you played a big role in, in, uh, in helping their lives get better. That's got to be a great feeling of uh, uh, just accomplishment. Um, so when, on your GGB show, one of the questions you ask when you ask your list of questions, which I love, uh, is uh, what superpower would people like? And when you talk to Mario Lopez, who is a good friend of mine, I love Mario, and he is like, he is almost, you and he are, are kind of uh, the same in so many ways because both of you, and when you discussed it with him, you were talking about the fact that every hotel you're, you're in, there he is, which is true. And I always joke with him about that. I say, I cannot get away from you. You know, you're following, you're stalking. I want to get a, uh, uh, you know, a, <laughs> a court order to keep you from following me around. But uh, he, he does everything just like you do. And when you asked the superpower, he said, uh, my superpower would be cloning myself. And I'm thinking that's a good superpower for you. That would be a great superpower for you to have. I would love to have that the night where I could just sleep all day and let my phone <laughs> do all of the work. <laughs> exactly. You know, and because you do so many things, it's almost impossible. One of the things you do, and it is the thing that uh, made you famous, of course, uh, is your great music. And <clears throat> you, um, you've had 17 albums, CDs out. And I believe you have a new one on the way. Can you give us any any hint on that? Yeah, I got a project I'm working on with a couple of special friends of mine, Ice Cube, E-40, and Too Short. And the group is called Mount Westmore. Ah. Four superpowers from the West Coast coming together. 
That's great. You know, becoming a group, making great music, you know, putting it back to where it's supposed to be. And I think the first time you will see us performing will be at the fight April 17th. Fight. Really? That's fantastic. I can't wait. I'm hoping to be there alongside you. You better be there. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. Yeah, I, I, that, that's an opportunity. Hey, if I miss out on that opportunity, uh, my, my son, who you saw, who waved to you beforehand, will probably leave home and disown me. So he, he probably won't. He'll never speak to me again. So I will make sure that I make that happen. But that's a, a pretty amazing thing on two levels. One, that you guys are doing it. And two, that you're going to debut it on April 17th, which means it gives people uh, way more, uh, in addition to the boxing, gives people another reason to, uh, uh, to watch that event. That's what we do. We try to give you the best entertainment that you've ever seen. The fights are going to be amazing. The, the performance are going to be amazing. The, the, the analyzing of it all, the commentary is going to be amazing. It's just going to be some good stuff. And, you know, this is what the world needs now. We need culmination of people coming together. Yeah. Not this color people, this background of people, but just people coming together to represent a good time and entertainment and fun. Can't, couldn't agree more with that. And toward that end, you have oftentimes in the things you've done, bridged, uh, um, crossed bridges. And one of the things that you did that I get a big kick out of you, this may surprise you, uh, I love many forms of music. One of the forms of music I love is gospel music. And believe it or not, I grew up as a kid watching Mahalia Jackson when she used to sing. So that was, you know, it's, I love that. And you did a really good gospel album. You surprised the world by doing it. I love the song with Rance Allen. That's one of my faves. Uh, yeah, it's a great one. They're all good. And when you did that, you talked earlier about taking gambles and doing things. That was a slightly risk-taking move in a way but born out of, again, if it's born out of your true uh, interest in doing it, it, it can only end up good, and it did. Thank you, man. Well, my grandmother inspired that. Uh, I did it for her. She had passed away by the time I did it. But one thing that we always spoke on was when I went to see her was how she could never play my music, and everybody loved me, and they loved her. Yeah. But she could never listen to my music because I never had music to represent you know, what she thought was great music, which was gospel music. So I made it a must to, you know, make a project that I could dedicate to her and, and make sure that I did it right and, and kept it all the way thorough and clean and gospel and, you know, all about the spirit and reached out to the greatest artists in the world that were making gospel music and ran silent, you know, just so happened to get back to me and, and we did a video for it and the whole nine. It just felt good that I was able to do my, you know, my grandmother justice by putting together something that, she could be that's, that, that is nice. That, that's a great reason for doing it. And uh, somewhere up there, she's, uh, she's looking down and uh, happy that, you know, that you did that for sure. Um, and because we taught, point out how eclectic you are, we go from gospel to the gin that you are, <laughs> that you are putting out there. We can make these quick bridge, bridge crosses. It's very easy. Um, uh, indigo. Uh, and it comes, of course, you had your big hit Gin and Juice years and years ago. And this is kind of a, a natural, uh, you know, uh, 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 creation from that. You, uh, you're gonna, are you going to show us? You got to, oh, perfect. There it is. Very attractive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, number one, how's that going? And uh, what, what, uh, what's the motivation there? I had to make it purple. You know, I'm a Laker fan. I had to put that purple on. You are, yes. Yeah, it looks, yeah, Laker colors. Perfect. It's going very well. It's, it's uh, starting to, you know, become a part of every store across America now. We just slowly but surely put it together. I've been like the ambassador of gin since I came out, but I was never able to have my hands on the, you know, the company side of it. It was like either I did a deal with Tangeray or a deal with Seagram's, and they would never cut me into the, you know, the equity side of it. So I decided to create my own brand so that way I could be an equity holder and actually own the product and give you some product that's good because I know, you know, I am the man when it comes to gin and juice. So I just gave you some gin with juice already in it. It's professionally put together. It's, you know, it's signed, sealed, and delivered, and it's available for you. It's a great idea to mix the two and make it already, uh, infuse it in there. And uh, probably has given people a different, uh, kind of a different taste for that, which is cool. 
we got this coming out too. Some of that 19 crimes rose. You understand me? I'm not playing, man. I'm I'm in the game. I'm heavy in the game, man. Very good. All right, look, that's <laughs> all right. All right. I'm gonna on April 17th. I might sample some of that, uh, before, but not not just before the show. When we go on, I'll I'll do it after. No, no, no. I mean, can I do it before? You may need a toast to the a dining oh. duo, to me and you. You understand me? We'll do it. Maybe we'll do a toast on the air. I, I like that idea better. That's that's even a better idea. So you open, you're opening up new vistas for me. I, you know, what can I say? You ready to tap in? It's your world. Ah, there you go. Now we're going to continue with our conversation with Snoop Dogg, but I wanted to explain that in this segment, I'm going to turn the tables on him. During his GGB shows that were so widely popular, he had a set list of questions that he asked all the guests at a certain point in the interview, and they were interesting and sometimes provocative. And so for this interview, I decided to ask Snoop Dogg those questions. And as it turns out, I'm the first person ever to do that. Here it is. When you wake up the first thing in the morning, what do you think of? How much good I can do. That's excellent. Uh, favorite cartoon? Snoopy, Charlie Brown. There, oh, there you go. See, this is hard when you're on the other end, isn't it? You always ask people, but has anyone ever done this to you before? Never. That's why you... All right. I'm in I'm, I'm you with it. Uh, favorite cereal? Cookie Crisp. Good one. Uh, worst job you've ever had? Selling newspapers for the Press Telegram. There, there you go. And uh, 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 the best live show you've ever seen? Ooh. Mm. That's good. Mm. Best live show I've ever seen. Yeah, it's hard ones, isn't it? That's hard. I would have to say Run DMC in Amsterdam. 1995. That sounds good. That sounds good. All right. Now, the last two are from the other section that you always do to the other folks on the show. Um, if I could work with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Sade. Ah, oh, that's a good one. Um, and uh, if I could see anyone perform dead or alive, who would it be? James Brown. Yeah, that's a good one also. And finally, my name is Snoop Dogg, and I'm a... Tycoon. There you go. All right. I, you know what? Hey, I'm so glad I, I was the first one to give you those questions that you always ask everybody else. We call that flip the script. You flip the script on me, dog. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you liked it. Uh, and good answers. See, and, it's, and now you have a little, uh, um, also a little insight into where you're asking the people those questions, uh, you know, the, the answers they come back with. Uh, they, and, they, and you have gotten some great answers from people over the years. <laughs> That's for sure. Snoop, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. April 17th, you're starting a new uh, uh, a fight club uh, promotion. Uh, it's got music. It's got boxing. Uh, Jake Paul and Ben Askren will be the, the main event. And um, uh, you've, you've given us a, a, a hint about a very important music part of it that's going to be a, a big event that's going to happen. And uh, we're looking forward to it. I want another add this piece to it, too. We have a piece called put down the guns and pick up the gloves. We got two guys who are rappers who had issues with each other. And instead of them shooting, they're gonna fight. It's Gonzo and Bosco, they're gonna be added to the fight as well. So this is a new initiative that we starting to drop the guns and pick up the gloves. So we starting to you know, stop that violence in the community and get them to get in the gloves and figure out their differences like that. So we add that yeah. to that. Now, that's a great idea. So that's, that's clever. Very, very clever. And more than clever, it's a good idea. So that is great. Well, looking forward to that. And um, uh, another piece to the, the, the fascinating jigsaw puzzle that is Snoop Dogg and the great, uh, the, great, the great stuff that you give all of us. I ain't like that, but I like that. The jigsaw puzzle called Snoop Dogg. You like it? I love that. All right. I'm, if you're good with it, then I'm, then I'm happy. I will see you in April. Yes, you will. Shout out to your son in the background. I know he's still back there. Enough for you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Snoop. Take care. Thank y'all. God bless. Thank you, man. So that was my conversation with Snoop Dogg. Uh, I found him to be just a 
great guy, likable, fascinating, interesting, and uh, just like when I talk to him on the phone, <laughs> interesting guy. And uh, uh, certainly he's going to be excited about his April 17th debut of Fight Club, the new boxing series that he is going to be a co-creator on and will be at ringside doing the commentary also. Let me introduce uh, the man who co-hosts with me each week here, Trip Mitchell. Hi, Trip. How you doing? Well, it's great to have Snoop on the show, and he is a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed him on the Tyson Jones fight. He uh, added a note of levity there. But I'm wondering, Al, in 40 years sitting ringside, have you ever looked over and saw a, a celebrity and go, what the heck am I doing here? Or have they ever come <laughs> up and wanted to talk to you during the fight? And has that ever affected your work? Yeah, very interesting question. You know, uh, early on in our uh, top rank boxing series, uh, there was a time where they were letting some other promoters uh, do fights. And Sylvester Stallone created a, a, a promotional company, did a couple of fights that were on ESPN. And he sat in with us during part of the broadcast as a commentator. And that was kind of interesting. This was right after the Rocky series had begun. And uh, looking over and seeing Sly Stallone there was an intriguing situation. I've We've had other people sit in. And sometimes celebrities can surprise you at moments when you don't expect to see them. Uh, I was doing the uh, Mayweather uh, Pacquiao fight. And at one point, uh, three or four minutes before the show, we're getting ready to go on the air. And somebody taps me in the back at ringside. Somehow he must have slipped through all the the, <laughs> the stage managers and all the rest. And I turn around and it's Jamie Foxx. <laughs> And he said, hey, I just want to come up and say hi to you. And I'm, we're having so much fun. He had done the anthem. And he said, you know, this is great. And he's carrying on a conversation with me, you know, and I'm enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. But I have to go on the air in like about a minute and a half, you know. And so uh, <laughs> finally, somebody said, oh, they have to go on the air. He said, oh, sorry, you know, but it was it was fun and it was good. So you can be surprised at times when, uh, you know, when different uh, A-listers uh, can come and talk to you. And we had an experience, and I've joked about it before, where David Brenner wanted to be a third person in yes. our booth. <laughs> he was feeling no pain that night, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, so. we were doing a, a fight, you and I, and uh, he wanted to join in. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we had to kind of painfully say, oh, I don't think we can do that, you know. And, that, that I think, and I think he suggested it while we were on the air, didn't he? He did. Yeah. Uh, have you ever, have, have a star ever come up and wanted to do a selfie with you and that sort of thing? Does that uh, We've had make some, for an... It, yeah, that's fun. That's always fun because it, it surprises you. You know, it's somebody that maybe you're not even aware they're, they're hip to who you are. And uh, so it's, you know, it's always, it's always fun. Listen, we live in a society where uh, A-list people are always fun to be around and you get a kick out of uh, meeting them and, and knowing them. So uh, it's always a good time. Well, we've got three questions, and actually, I'm, I'm going to do in a little different order. We have a, a movie question here. R. Quinn asked, can you share any details about working on Streets of Gold? It's one of my favorite boxing movies. Ah, yeah. Uh, and, and our questions, by the way, come to us on Twitter, at Al Bernstein, so you can always send me a boxing question or any question like this. And that's interesting. I did a cameo appearance in the Streets of Gold where I played uh, Go Figure, myself as a boxing announcer. And uh, that movie starred Klaus Maria Brandauer and a very young Wesley Snipes very early in his career and Adrian Pazdor as well. And it was about a couple of young um, uh, amateur boxers uh, and Klaus Maria Brandauer was their coach. And it was pretty well received. It was, it was a pretty good boxing movie. And I, you know, I went there just to do my sections uh, in uh, what was kind of a blank area soundstage and they were going to have the crowd separate and whatever. So I didn't have to do it in front of a crowd. It's usually the case. And I didn't have to interact with the other actors. However, it was on a shooting day when they were all around and uh, all three of the stars came by uh, and uh, I got to chat with them about the movie and they talked about it. And, and in fact, uh, it was interesting because Klaus Maria Brandauer started asking me questions about, because he's the trainer in the movie. He said, these two level of fighters, what kind, where would they be at in, in boxing? And what would I, what are some of the things they would have to know? And I was telling him some of these things. And then he turns to the, 
uh, producer Joe Roth, their director, and he says, you know, he said, some of these ideas are good. I think I'm going to use some of these and <laughs> uh, and say some of these. And I'm like, and I saw the director. I'm like, oh, all right, I don't want to be responsible for trying to put ideas in his head. But it was kind of an interesting uh, conversation. But that movie was a fun, it was a fun experience to do it. And, uh, and it turned out to be a pretty good film, too. How many films have you been in now? Oh, I don't know, maybe about 10 or 12, I think you know wow in that area yeah and a few tv series as well uh, i'm still waiting for that breakout role though you know where i can play uh somebody else <laughs> okay <laughs> well if you think about it the boxing announcers are closer to the action than any other major sport maybe basketball yeah, i guess cause true. You've done, but you're right there you're surrounded by the fans so there's an intimacy there you don't have with football or other sports yeah it's a good point that may be part of the reason why so often in boxing movies they want to include uh, you know, uh, the different commentators and, uh, and it's always a fun experience. You know, it's, it's always interesting because you get to, and I've, I've said this on, on the show here once before the best experience, and it fits into your earlier question too, actually was while I was filming, uh, uh, a Showtime, uh, made for a TV movie, uh, Elaine Stritch, the famous Broadway actress and iconic figure in Broadway was in the, the film. And I had done my thing and they, they were all at, it was a fight scene where they were all sitting there. And after it, I, you know, I, 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 she came up to me and started chatting with me and she was not a boxing fan, but she just wanted to chat. And so I got to ask Elaine Stritch all about Broadway and, and her experiences. And she was asking me things and it was, you know, it was like meeting a theater royalty. So that was fun. Okay. Well, our next question comes from Donovan. Casp, and he asked, on the anniversary of the Ali Frazier, I want to ask you what your memories were of that fight for the first time. Who were you with? Where were you? And did you call anyone to talk about the fight? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, 50 years ago, of course, that fight was, uh, uh, was held and we just celebrated the 50th anniversary. And that was a watershed moment, I think, for, for the sport. Uh, it was a watershed moment for the country. Uh, it had more, it was certainly a sporting event that transcended just sports uh, with all the political overtones to it. And back in those days, you know, you, there was no pay-per-view. You had to go to see fights at theaters or arenas, and it was a closed circuit kind of a situation. And I went to a, uh, uh, I think it was the Park West Theater in uh, Chicago. It was a the theater where they normally had shows and things and um and sat with about 3000 other people as we watched the the fight and people cheered and uh and it was and it was interesting and you know the funny thing about it is i think i went alone i i i i'm, I'm kind of remembering that nobody came with me i just said i'm going to go and it, at at a certain point i realized i had not asked anyone to come with me but i didn't care and of course you, when you're in that setting it's just like being in a sporting event where you'll talk to people uh and we were all having a great time you know at, at the fight uh and uh i don't know if i called anybody uh right afterwards i know uh that was the kind of event where you you literally when you were done watching it you were trying to absorb everything that you just saw. And, and not only was that event, I, event iconic because of its importance, it was a fantastic boxing match. And, uh, and just that part of it was enough to send you home from that theater with this glow about the sport of boxing. And, and a sidelight to that is the man that called the play-by-play -play on that was the great Don Dunphy who of course is one of the great voices of all time in the sport of boxing and a man who I would later meet uh, when I became a boxing announcer on ESPN. I did an interview with him and got to know him. He became a mentor and a friend to me. Uh, and on that broadcast, they paired him, believe it or not, with Burt Lancaster, the actor. <laughs> and, <laughs> the noted boxing the, historian. Yes, okay. the noted boxing historian and analyst. And this is because Jerry Parencio, who was the uh, the the, one of the promoters was a, t, a, a a movie guy. He wanted to have Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster actually announce the fight, and they talked him out of that. But <laughs> Don Duffy told me that yeah, yeah that he had made a deal with them. Well, you can have Burt Lancaster with me. I'll do the fight in Burt, with Burt Lancaster, but he doesn't talk during the rounds. And at one point, 
he Burt Lancaster got excited and was going to talk during the rounds, and and they had hand mics in that. Day, and uh, Don Dunphy said he put his hand on the mic to keep <laughs> Burt Lancaster from. So not too many too many people are probably at that time were willing to try and shut up Burt Lancaster, but uh, Don Dunphy was, did it. He was a confident guy. <laughs> okay. And we've got another question from Mike Butts, and I love this. Since we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Ali Frazier, what was the greatest fight that you ever saw in person as both a spectator and a broadcaster? Yeah, there are, of course, many candidates to this, and it's so hard to, to, to quantify and say, you know, which one is, uh, is the best. But if I have to pick one, it, it, it is um, the 2005 fight uh, between Jose Luis Castillo and Diego Corrales. Um, it was uh, not only the most exciting fight I've ever seen in terms of the action, but fought at such a high skill level that it was extraordinary. And what made that fight great was it was a great action fight and then had a wild ending where in round 10, uh, Diego Corrales went down twice in that, uh, in that fight, was able to get up and then stop Jose Luis Castillo with a TKO win in that very round. So round uh, 10 of that fight turned out to be one of the most dramatic rounds in history. And, uh, and the fight itself was amazing. And, you know, I've called thousands and thousands of matches and many of them extraordinarily exciting. But uh, I have to say that one probably tops the list. Um, I think this is the point in our show where we uh, mentioned Tommy Ankello, who has the uh, great YouTube channel, uh, World Class Boxing. So if you are a boxing fan and you uh, enjoy the sport, uh, number one, uh, you can learn some history by going to that channel, but also you can learn about how, about the actual art of boxing. He's got some great videos on there that are designed for young boxers but also have uh, application to all of us in terms of watching the sport of boxing. So go to World Class Boxing uh, on YouTube and uh, Tommy Ankello will have some great stuff for you. We hope, Trip, that we're going to have some great stuff on our next show because we are going to have Larry Holmes with us, uh, the legendary uh, former heavyweight champion. So that should be fun. Yeah, Larry was, during the 80s, he... Uh was the transitional heavyweight champion yep. and, and really was a, a boxer who was much greater than people probably remember. But yeah. he was truly one of the greats. Yeah, it's easy for him to get overshadowed as the man that succeeded Larry or um, uh, Muhammad Ali as the world champion. But I think most folks that are objective about it uh, understand that Larry Holmes had an amazing run as heavyweight champion and uh, and is a great in the sport of boxing in his own right. So we're going to chat with Larry on our next show. Well, my thanks to uh, Snoop Dogg for visiting with us. Uh, hope you guys all enjoyed uh, that conversation as much as I did. Uh, my thanks to Tripp, of course, for his fine work. Thanks to all of you for participating with your questions. And uh, also, um, we uh, are happy that you joined us in general for the show. We'll see you next time. <laughs>